Next, next in. in. Oh, welcome to Next In. Mm -hmm. Wow, look at that. It popped up on us quickly. Elise, we are so glad to have you. I'll have you say your last name just so I don't screw it up. But this mm -hmm. is Elise. She is the head of the Nashville Tech Council. For anyone who follows our videos, please like, subscribe if you don't because you're missing out. But we had met with Brian Moyer maybe a year ago or so. So Brian was just on his way out. And you have now taken over the Nashville Tech Council. So you're like the most important person in Nashville, minus Governor Lee and the mayor. But other than that, it's Elise. So it's like a huge honor to have you. Um, so obviously, Shane and myself run next in the podcast. So Elise, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you wound yourself into running essentially the kind of Nashville Tech Council is very much at the epicenter of technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, here in Nashville. How'd you end up there? I know, obviously, when you get talking, people hear that you have a little bit of an accent, so you're uh -huh. not, and it's not a Southern accent. So. No, it's not. So, yeah, so I'll start with my name. So, at least Cambernack, not that hard, not as hard as it looks, uh, and definitely easy to pronounce. You just give it a shot, and it's going to work out. Uh, as you can tell, this is not an American word, name, I was born and raised in France, and uh, but I've spent the last going on what twenty four years in Nashville. So I'm Nashvilleian more than I am, a, you know, French person these days. Um, so how did I end up in the tech council? Well, I spent all my career in tech, usually, I mean, mostly healthcare tech, and have been a friend of the tech council for many years. I've been mentoring. Um, uh, leadership, uh, people in leadership programs. I've been attending events. I've been years ago worked with my boss on a couple of committees. So I've been always in the surrounding and the tech council. And, uh, and to me, after 20 years in the uh, 20 plus years in the healthcare IT, I was ready for a change. So when the opportunity knocked and it actually knocked on I think the email arrived on New Year's Eve, to be that, to be exact, uh, from the recruiters to start the conversation. It was just the right first step in that direction, and it's been a fun journey so far, from you know, meeting the the board and interviewing to actually starting in April and uh, and working with a team. Um, and so it's been so fun, fun so far. I'm no longer a newbie. I'm officially 100 plus days in, so I'm an old timer now. Yeah, very much so. So we'll start with the tough question. Why are you a million times better than Brian Moyer? No, I'm kidding. Huh. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You're like, wait, whoa, whoa. That's way too. No, no. We love Brian. So a little bit about what does the NTC do, Nashville Tech Council, for those who aren't super familiar, if you're not inside Nashville, you might not know what it does. If you're here and you're part of technology, I would assume you're pretty familiar with it. But for everyone else, mm -hmm. what is it that the Nashville Tech Council does? Well, so you'll be surprised how many local um, locals do not know everything that the tech council do. Um, people get engaged at different levels depending on who's co uh, who they, what company they are with, what their interest is. And when you start telling the entire story of what we do, they're like, huh, I didn't know you did that. I'm like, yes, we do. We do a lot. Um, and so we spent, because I spent the first 90 days learning, I spent a lot of time with my team trying to define it into a, a single story. So our story is that the Tech Council impacts the tech community from kindergarten to CIO. Surprising, right? You'd think mm -hmm. we're the Tech Council, we have small company members, we are trade associations with everybody from a startup to a Fortune 100 company. And we're uh, benefiting just our members and we're putting this amazing award ceremony every year. But we're really impacting the tech ecosystem from kindergarten to CIO. So if you think about it in multiple ways, well, uh, our main focus and funding is through our members. So we're putting program content for our members to help them grow their own tech talent, recruit their tech talent, provide opportunities for professional development. So little plug in a month from a month from now we have a two-day conference called the nashville analytics summit and it's really yep. a two days uh packed event for people who want to learn more about ai analytics in general we have 65 speakers so it's going to be a fun two days event so we're putting this kind of 
content-driven event for members and their employees. Uh, because if you're a member, every employee in your company is a member and can participate. And then we do a lot of networking to allow people to connect with each other. We have peer groups and affinity groups that, uh, that allow our community to work together in, and grow together on a certain topic. But we also give back to our community and really focusing on building the tech talent pipeline of tomorrow. So what do we need to do in the classroom today or with teachers in middle school, high school, elementary school so that the next generation is ready to go to college for a tech career not and not something else, right? We need to grow that tech career. So we really touch everybody from say kindergarten. I think our youngest programs right now are um, touching the third grade. So we're really third grade to CIO. Yeah, just full disclosure, Next Level, the company Shane and I run, is a member of the Tech Council. So, you are. And, and we love it. We love it. We've gone to multiple events. We've done, I think probably arguably what we really enjoy is a lot of the giving back side of it. Mm -hmm. um, I got to do some mentorship with a high school student who had to do a pitch competition. Yeah. I know Shane is going to be doing one of the... Um, uh, tech and teach. I forget the, the I talk about that. improving LinkedIn profiles and how to make yourself stand out. I just saw the, uh, the email out from my team to say, hold the date. Uh, so yeah, so we do uh -huh. back to the community, a lot of things that are individual contribution, like Taylor and Shane, you're doing really impacting and mentoring, uh, rising, um, young adults, right? So our teenagers, we do have summer camps, we do have other things like that. And I know we're also taking our uh, students in the from the community that we serve into tech companies. So you're also going to host, I think when your office is open, what we call a traveling tech day, where it's really a show and tell, right? We're loading a bus full of kids from a high school in a, you know, a county, and matching them up with a couple of companies that day so they get exposed to technology and have this little wow factor. Hmm. Technology is not just coding. No, it's not, yep. right? And giving yep. them that little spark that will give them inspired in high school to look at next steps in technology fields. Because like I, there was a world where I wanted to be in technology and I was just like, oh, that'd be so cool. And then I sat down and started writing code and I was like, my ADHD. <laughs> It's so it's bonkers. Like I'm like, oh, squirrel. Like I, I don't know yeah. what I'm gonna. And so it's always like this idea that like I wanted to contribute to something. So like the only things that I've been able to really do is like one, I've done technical recruiting, two, sales, and then three, I've been like a product manager on like a machine learning and artificial intelligence product. But that was just because like I was able to communicate and be kind of like the mm -hmm. the person in between that was able to speak to the to speak to the people that are writing code and the sales team and everything else in between. And I think some people overlook the fact that that's, that can be a very important role within technology. Oh, this is totally technology. Um, to me, this is a technology job. This is a technology career. As a matter of fact, there's like 26 different job codes that we're tracking as technology jobs for our annual job report. So it's interesting to see the breadth and, and width of those job codes and people don't necessarily think about that. You know, project management is one of them, as you said, not just program management or product development. And it's interesting to really expand that horizon to people who are not into tech and kind of demystify what tech is. Because to your point, when you start learning about tech, you learn coding. So if in your coding class, well, you're going to have to write your own requirements. You're going to write your code and test your code. Well, in real life, you don't do all three because otherwise it's not going to be a good product. You cannot write, you know, write and test your own code. Uh, and you know that, but as a young, uh, young student, you don't. And it's really looking at the different aptitudes that are necessary to kind of be in tech and communication to business stakeholders is huge um, because not all techies are good communicators, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think it's I think it's awesome. I'm we are really excited to have the students come in. We are mm -hmm. really excited to be in our new offices, which will be much larger. So, and yes, we we will be in the offices by the time they come here. So, it's exciting. I like a lot of what you guys do. That it isn't just hey, here's some networking events, but it's here's networking events. Here's the you know the CIO side of it, but also as we look at it with a massive. Um, 
uh, discrepancy in amount of tech workforce, there does have to be a, a component of the education mm -hmm. instead of just going, how do we fly them in from Seattle or Chicago or San Francisco, but we've got to start homegrown mm -hmm. um, technology, which can start as early as, like you said, third grade or high school or whatever, whatever age it is. And so what do you see as the future? And I know, hey, you're you're not fully, you're, you're over 100 days, but obviously you're going to lay out some goals and mm -hmm. some path that you want to see NTC take. What do you see as like where I want it to be in, whether it's a year, five years, 10 years, whatever? So uh, I'll start with the, the real, the biggest problem at hand in our community. And, the, and when I say our tech community, I'm talking the entire tech ecosystem and, and all the members we serve, but also, uh, you know, our higher education uh, partners uh, or all the education system. And the, the largest challenge is really finding that tech talent. Uh, Nashville's economic development has been wonderful. We've had, we've been blessed with a lot of moves of technology companies during the, during or even before the pandemic. The pandemic accelerated all that. Uh, there was a national report uh, published in the Wall Street Journal actually uh, last May to say that Tennessee was the number one state in terms of transition of tech jobs during the pandemic. So we had the massive migration, 8% growth during those two years of tech jobs. That doesn't mean tech people. So what does it mean to us, and especially for us as NTC, is how do I keep bring the community together and all our members to solve this perceived and now pretty real talent shortage? If the jobs are moving and the companies are moving to Nashville, the headquarters are moving and we want to grow tech jobs and we need to be in person to have that. The, the personal growth and development, um, not every job is meant to be remote. How do I solve this? So to me is really positioning NTC as a key player in connecting talent creators to talent consumers. That's kind of the, the words that I've been starting to use lately because a talent creator could be uh, a high school uh, as well as a state community college or a boot camp. Uh, organization that prepares um, people to be tech job ready. And so you could be tech job ready after a two-year associate's degree, or you can be tech job ready after a four-month boot camp as, uh, as a career transitioner. So how do I connect those talent creators to the talent consumers who need that influx of I would call it junior talents because if you're just got your skills right where they need to be to be hired, you're not a senior. You might be senior, more senior in age, but if you're new to development, you're new to business analysis, you're new to testing, you're you're, you're new into your job. And uh, and how do I connect them and make that link so that the people that we create, the talents that we're creating in Nashville stay in Nashville and get hired at the Nashville, the Nashville Technology Council companies. So question, um, we talk about third grade, talked about high school, and then obviously we've got CIO, so it's this post-grad, it's, it's the companies. Do you have anything where you're doing or working on, and this comes kind of personally, both Shane and I worked in a company that was pretty heavily involved in the university system, mm -hmm. where you're really you know finding a way at not just the, the local community college, but UT Knoxville, UT Chattanooga, MTSU, UT mm -hmm. Martin, University of Memphis, and then maybe even expanding a little bit outside of that, because one thing we've seen from hiring in our own talent, we get a lot of our, uh, a lot of our talent internally has come from, we'll call it the SEC states, mm -hmm. you know, Arkansas and North Carolina, South Carolina, Kentucky, Alabama, Mississippi, where Nashville in a lot of ways is kind of that major city in between a lot of like if you're from Lexington, Kentucky, you probably Nashville's probably your version of the most the largest regional city that you're yeah. close to, I guess, Indianapolis or whatever. But Nashville's the cool place to move. If you're in Little Rock, Nashville tends to be. Cool. You know, it's probably I grew up in Chicago. It's probably similar. If you're in if you're in Wisconsin, a lot of times Chicago is the major hub mm -hmm. in the middle of, the, you know, the major hub in the middle of all the, the wheel. So actually, we're doing a lot of things there. They're not fully uh, developed yet. Uh, 
So the NTC works, uh, we have a board of directors and we have committees that are chaired by our uh, board members. And the most active committee is what we call the education committee. It's We have so many initiatives that we're pursuing and developing that we're going to break it out into two or three different committees that can be more focused. And one of the workshops is actually at the end of this month, uh, we're laying the foundation for uh, improving the internship uh, coordination between our universities and member companies. So we're really trying to do a stepping stone uh, internship is the entry point into a job, right? Because if you have a, for a summer internship and it's successful, you might be hired as a part-time employee during your senior year, and that would land into a full-time job when you graduate. So we're doing this, and the next phase after that, we'll be facilitating the same process for graduating students so that we have a seamless way to have, or, well, seamless probably very, uh, you know, uh, aspirational but a better way to connect all the students to all the opportunities and make it easier for employers and uh, uh, talent creators which they are to really connect and have a pathways for their students to find a solution i think there's a lot of that to be said in the way we track that talent right we don't necessarily have aligned metrics universities don't fully track uh where they're, they're they track a little bit where their graduates are, but if I want to narrow it down into tech, they cannot tell me how many of their tech graduates stayed in Nashville. They know in general. They know how many in general uh, got a job out of graduation, but mapping it all out to see where they're going is something that we're missing and we want to get into. And, um, and then when this first phase is successful, my vision is that we want to expand that to, to your point, the SEC, uh, SEC states. And I didn't really think about the attractiveness of Nashville. My, also, my first focus was more, let's look at all those universities who produce the most computer science talent in general, right? And the, the tech talent in general, whatever, uh, whatever degrees we want to really hire out of who has the most uh, students graduating. And even if only 10, 5% of them would open up our job opportunities and consider it, that's 5% we don't have today. So it's really starting with Nashville because we have the connections, we have those in-person meeting, we can build it up. And once we pilot that, how do we attract the same thing and build it up and expand out of our region to now attract the same talent into the region? Mm -hmm. So what are maybe, you know, I don't know it as well. I could tell you if you ask me in the Midwest, what schools are good at what, you know, like University of Illinois, very, <laughs> very, very highly regarded engineering school, computer science program, stuff like that. Um, University of Michigan, yeah. you know, and then I know some schools are better at construction management or whatever it is. What is what school down here do you feel is producing the computer science or the engineering uh, the school you know, schools to go to, obviously Vanderbilt has just the general education that they're thought of very highly, but. Yeah. So in the middle Tennessee area, we're looking at so those four year degrees, definitely. I mean, they're, they're all playing a part in different ways. Right. Um, so Vanderbilt for engineering, you have MTSU for a lot of uh, computer science and media and other things. Uh, you have Lipscomb and Belmont who have more niche programs that are still very valuable in tech. So if you put them all together, Middle Tennessee is it's quite a good group of people uh, that we can go after. And then if I expand out though, all those computer science like or tech jobs that those universities are uh, produce every, uh, every year really, um, pales in comparison to a Virginia Tech, for example. So we had a summer intern who did some research and has given us, let's say, in the eight-hour drive circle around Nashville, or 10 hours. I mean, there are schools that we could reach. He's made a, a study this summer of how many uh, computer science STEM kind of programs are at these universities and how many students graduate. And we're going to review that research and figure out what our target market is. Yeah. And if we're going out of town, right, if we don't build those, we don't have those relationships and we don't have those connections, we need to go with the numbers. If Virginia Tech has 3,000 computer science students every every year that graduate, even if only 10 of them would would consider, would open job, 
job listing from Nashville and come to visit Nashville and consider moving, it's a win. Yeah, I would assume University of Alabama doesn't. I don't think those students are very smart. But otherwise, you know, I'm just Georgia kidding. Tech. I mean, I'm in Virginia Tech, but you have Georgia Tech. That's another one a few hours away. Don't know much more uh, north of us. But, uh, you know, if we have a handful of those universities and we can create a repeatable program, uh, I don't want to create a one off where I have to chase all those relationships all the time, but have a program that can promote Nashville as a tech de destination for graduating students and have the process behind it to capture those students. I think that's where we want to, that's where we're focusing on. I, I, yeah, I think that's awesome. We did similar work. We're, we're doing the exact same thing for internal looking at going, let's find a couple of schools where we can really have a repeatable process. Mm -hmm. And maybe it is Ole Miss and University of Tennessee, Knoxville and uh, University of Memphis or Auburn or wh whatever right. school it is. So, to kind of transition out of just the Nashville, what about the, the tech in general right now? And we talked about this actually on our podcast. Uh, I think it was our last one or whatever. It was, you know, you're hearing a lot of like, oh, the layoffs, you know, oh, the layoffs. This company laid off 300 people. And, you know, I, I have my feelings. I'm curious what your thoughts as you are involved with a lot of companies here in Nashville. And I don't think I've heard any major layoffs in the Nashville story. Um, maybe oh, sure, yeah, that's it. Sure, yeah, that's right. <laughs> You know, but what are you here? Do you hear? Is it is it the media that's kind of making sure that there's a story because it's a 24 hour media cycle? They've got to have a story, or or do you think there's like, hey, this is the impending doom for the next year? What what do you see with the layoffs happening? So this becomes really Elise's personal opinion based on my conversation. I see it two two ways, and it's two sides probably of the same coin but different stories. There's the story of well, it's not been a great year so far and we've got to cut corners and we're going to look at our cost uh, profile and see where we can be more cost effective and reduce our costs. Uh, different companies have different approaches to doing this, but I believe that in the looming potential recession, a lot of companies have taken precautions on their cost model, right? So does that mean layoffs? It could be. Uh, it could be a strategic positioning as well. And I'm not into, right, obviously not into those conversations. So companies might reduce spend in a different way. Some companies might uh, might reduce staff. All, all in all is to become more recession-proof in case and when it happens. But on the flip side, Talent is always the number one conversations that leaders bring to my attention. It's like, yeah, yeah, we're having a bad day and we're cutting and we can't, sorry, I'm, we can't spend that much money with NTC right now, but we can find talent and we have so many positions we need to hire for. So it's kind of a dichotomy of, well, you can really spend the money because you've got to be nimble, but if you don't hire the talent, you can't build anything to solve the problem we have in your companies in the first place, right? And, uh, and leaders recognize that and the really feels at times that it's an exercise, uh, a math exercise on the cost side uh, versus a talent and growth and strategy side on the other, other one. So there's really that short-term, long-term view. And I've been actually very pleasantly surprised to hear so many companies talk about recruiting more talent and needing to do that even after it's it's been very clear that they're making Cost you know, there's a, there's a lot of interesting conversations that we get to have being on like the recruiting agency side where we're seeing a lot of these layoffs and, mm -hmm. you know, to your point, at least there's like, there's, there's a, there's a variety of reasons, right? Like one is, Hey, we genuinely want to become quote unquote recession proof, or we want to make sure mm -hmm. that we can make sure that we're hitting our deliverables for end of the year and quarterly reviews and all, there, there's all that. And bonuses mm -hmm. are getting ready to be paid out and we want to save money. There, there's also conversations around you know, there are a lot of companies that are struggling right now. And when you see companies struggling, there are times where acquisitions become r real options. And then sometimes it's like, well, how do I acquire that business when I've got some fat that needs to be cut over here? And like right. the only way that acquisition makes sense is if we loosen up dollars. And I know that there are organizations where they're like, we want to acquire this business because it's a feasible option today. And it's mm -hmm. interesting because because as, as social media has be, become more and more prominent and people are starting to open up a lot more around failures and they're starting to express mm -hmm. themselves more, we're starting to see people being a lot more open around layoffs and being laid off and it's amplifying on social media. And, mm -hmm. but 
I, I don't know if it's if it's any different this year as it was last year or the year before or the year before. I just think that we have a community that is supporting, amplifying, and, and allowing people to connect in a faster way than we've ever had before. And uh, I think you, you hit the nail on the head here because you're right. It's no different than last year and the year before, just more transparent and more open. And, uh, and that, you know, you all know, m and is always tied with, you know, cost reduction. You cannot acquire a company and continue to consume their entire uh, cost model and staff structure without making tough decisions. It's not necessarily happening day one. It could be happening day, you know, six months in and others. And those become strategic decisions that timing wise could look like, uh, you know, a, a layoff due to re impeding recession, right? Um, and those are really strategic uh, conversations that are happening in this company. And that's for part of their growth strategy. Isn't that, didn't Asurion just acquire Enjoy? And they also like a month prior laid off 600 people, right? So I think, I think that's, you know, to Shane's point, like there's some, there's some business dynamics behind it that mm -hmm. social media does, isn't going to amplify. And then on top of it, you see companies lay off 400 people and it's this big news story. And then you're like, well, that's like 4% of their staff, which a lot of companies will, that, that's actually like a planned you know, Amazon will lay off X amount of people. Amazon has crazy year. rules that like, it's like tw the, the bottom 29% every year has to be cut. And, and, and they're very radical view of that methodology, which is like the bottom 29 have to be cut. And even if you're in the top 5% teams in the entire company, if you're the bottom 29% on the team, you're, you're, you're cut. Um, and so they'll repurpose people if they happen to be in the bottom 29, even if you're in the top 10%, 5% tile of the entire company, it's it, the, the, even those are interesting strategies that happen. And, My and belief is most of these companies are doing the layoffs because they want our agency to come in and fill those seats. That's, that's just a, that's a guess. I'm not positive <laughs> yet, but that is my assumption. At least we're going to stick with that. So um, <clears throat> we're taking a lot of your time. I want to get into Nashville specific and Elise specific, right? I think that's more fun. You know, we can talk yeah. all about the, the other stuff. So you've lived here longer than I have, longer than Shane has, longer than most people here who have all come in the last three weeks. Um, and so you know the area pretty well. Um, so tell us, if you had to pick one thing to do in Nashville, what's your favorite thing to do? Favorite thing to do? Uh, oh, for a while, uh, it may change because it's changing, I think, every year because the scene has changed. So if you, if I read one a few years ago, my favorite thing to do was to go to the Skirmerhorn and have, go to listen to classical music and, and have a concert and spend the evening in town and then mixing up those different uh, experiences, right? You you have dinner at the honky tonk and then you go listen to classical music. And you know, so that's always been a fun thing, uh, switching into concerts in general, right? Not just the Skimmer Hornbird Bristol Arena and mixing up and experiencing the, the downtown uh, area. So that would be lately like evening uh, kind of thing. And you can never get bored with that uh, because every time you come, there's something new that you didn't know existed in town or something you expected to see has disappeared also. So seeing establishments come and go, and I'm not going out on the town um, that often. I mean, if I have two concerts or three a year, that's right. That's the most. Yeah. What's, what's your newest favorite venue that's recently popped up? Ooh. What's the newest venue? Give me a few names of newest venue. New uh, restaurant, new venue, new music, whatever. Just something new you've tried. Well, something new I've tried. I went yesterday to lunch at Fifth and Broads in the restaurant area, but not, not the food court, but the little new street that they have. I thought it was pretty cool. So I think that's where I'm going to go hang out next time is check out all those places and see if there's a cool place to, to go for music um, there. I keep being told I have to go to Fifth and Broadway. I know it's embarrassing, but I have five little kids. So it's like the idea of getting downtown just doesn't happen that often. But I do, I really do want to go down there. All I right. It took me 10 minutes to find the restaurant, by the way, because I went into the only parking I knew because I used to go see a member who's at the tower at the top. 
So I parked there and thought I would work in the food courts and didn't realize there was an entire street of restaurants outside. Yeah. So, it's, yeah. it's, it's absolutely boomed. I mean, mm-hmm. like it boomed down there. All right. So Shane, what's your favorite? Lately? I mean, I like going to Live Oak on Thursdays quite a bit just because I like, I, I like going to writer's rounds and whatnot. I think those are a lot of fun. I am going yeah. to a concert in December. I'm going to Andrew Peterson at the Ryman. So I will get out of the house past seven o'clock. Not that for so not for you sports. So yes, I am very excited. The Ryman is really, really cool. So, and I have seen Andrew Peterson's uh, Christmas thing that he does. So pretty excited about that. So, mm-hmm. um, all right. So favorite food, if you had to tell us, we have to go to a restaurant in town and, and I want people who are listening who are like, gosh, I got to get to Nashville and check it out. Where do you take an out of town guest that you have to like, they come into town and you're like, I've got to show you this restaurant. It's awesome. Oh, let's start with my house. How about that? Okay. Well, you know, <laughs> you, you're of French descent, so you're probably a good cook. I'm. I'm. I love to cook. I love to to entertain for food. I uh, wish I did that more often. Um, but if my house is not an option, um, very places in town. Oh my God, I'm drawing a blank. I've had so many lately. Mine's probably um, Martin's Barbecue. Any to anybody that comes here is going to Martin's Barbecue with me. It's, it's, ah, good, well, it's, it's so, a good excuse for myself, let alone everyone else. So this beautiful figure is brought to you by Martin's Barbecue. Uh, <laughs> it's sponsored by. It's sponsored by Martin's Barbecue, right? Yeah. So what well, depends also on on the type of experience you want and the and the money you want to spend on it. So comparing to the barbecue, have you been to Peg's Peg Legs Porker? I oh, really want to go. I have not gone, but I've heard. Really, you haven't gone, Shane? You've I, gone to like 18 Guatemalan restaurants here, and you haven't <laughs> gone to Peg Leg Porkers? So wow. I'm friends with a, with a CEO. I agree with Jamie. It is wonderful. I need to drive by and buy their sauce. It's just amazing. Anyway, and I'm a, becoming a very good friend with their, their founder and CEO, and he's he's a hoot. Um, and they also have a whiskey brand or bourbon brand. I don't know. I'm not. Anyway. So I would go there. Uh, it's really fun. And then if you move up the, you know, the dollar chain, uh, there are definitely uh, a lot of options in town. Um, my teenager's favorite is uh, Bourbon Steakhouse. And you have a view at the top of the JW Marriott. Says, so I, I think I gave you the two extremes. In the yeah. Yeah. Or like Audrey's. Audrey's is pretty good, but you walk out with two, hundred, two people. It's like a $600 meal. It's it's a little outrageous, but yeah, I'm not gonna do that. So Shane, where was the place we went? Why can I not remember? We were gonna go. It was either Bourbon Steak or the place that you and I went recently with our with our ladies. King Prime, yeah, King Prime. That's right. That's right. That was really good. I do want to try Bourbon Steak. I haven't tried that yet. Really want to do it. My spot is Mojo's Tacos, Mojo's Tacos in Franklin on the Factory. That's the place I take ever there in Soy Bistro. Soy Bistro is right down the block yeah. from our, our offices, and we go there way too much. I lied, Taylor. Brought to yeah. you by Soy Bistros. Yeah, Shane's Shane, <laughs> Shane body is sponsored by Soy Bistro. That's, so, that's when nobody's visiting me. <laughs> we go there a lot. It's awesome. It's a really, really, really cool place. We we, so, we both have items on the menu named after us, so it should have been oh, Soy Bistro. You can get the Taylor or you can get the Shane. Yeah. <laughs> they literally have a food item for us. We don't order any. We just say our name. Yeah. 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 Well, so the actually, funny part, yeah, the funny part is uh, what I didn't tell you about my background is uh, I actually left Nashville for four years to go live in India and came back to Nashville. So uh, we love to try Indian restaurants in town for sure. So it's probably the best, probably probably the best, the best food I've ever had in the world. Where, where in India did you live? Uh, we lived in Bangalore, India, okay. but visited the whole country. I had a I had a team uh, that used to to report up into me up in um, New Delhi, like yeah. uh, right right in the New Delhi area. Yeah. All right, so let's have an Indian food off. What's your favorite Indian food restaurant here? And Shane, you go second. Elise, what's your favorite Indian food restaurant you found around here? So the most authentic one to um, Southern Indian food, so Bangalore cuisine. And I've only had lunch there one time and I need to go more. It's Chohan. 
I walked in and had, well, they have a tally and they call it a tally and it's a metal plate and you have all those different sauces and it's a very traditional uh, um, Southern Indian lunch and, and prepared like he would in India. So I was pretty impressed with that. Okay. You gotta Same. go to Taj. Taj is really good. Taj, where is it at? Uh, do you know where like the Mariachi Plaza is? Mm -hmm. So first of yeah. all, the Mariachi Plaza is like really cool. They bring in like these Hispanic bands and like there's like this giant venue where you can like they play mariachi music and they have fun. And then around it, uh, they've got a bunch of like vendors and then they've mm -hmm. got like eight or nine different restaurants in the Mariachi Plaza. And like you can sit there and it's like a food courtyard and then everybody can go grab food from where they want. But attached to the Mariachi Plaza is a place called mm -hmm. Taj. And I would argue that Taj is likely like my favorite Indian mm -hmm. restaurant in town. I've been to like. 17 Indian restaurants within like you've a 20 hour more than, You've been more than I have. And so uh, in the Cool Spring area, there was one that we used to go to. And I think in the last five years, it's changed name, name and ownership at least five times. <laughs> and it's still an Indian restaurant. And it started as a Southern Indian vegetarian only restaurant that was delicious. It was called the Mysore Plaza, uh, Palace. Um, and it evolved and they added so much anyway. So I'm not as fun anymore. And I learned last month that it's yet another one. So. All right. Well, I'm going to take Elisa's recommendation because she lived in India. So, but then again, <laughs> there is Shane who has gone to every single. 17. Yes. More than I have for sure. I'm, I'm a little cheap. I think that, I think that, you know, it's, it's a little overpriced in my opinion. I'm, I'm not disagreeing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Elise, this is the last question. It has nothing to do with Nashville. What's your favorite movie? Huh. So I have a couple genres. It depends. Uh, my favorite movie, one of my favorite movies, I cannot pick a favorite, was Hidden Figures. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That was pretty good. That just came out like two years ago. Yeah, a little more than that. Hidden Figures. I don't know Hidden. That was NASA, right? The women behind NASA? Mm hmm yeah. yeah. The women computers. Did you know that in the 60s, actually in the 50s, a computer was not a computer like you know them today. The computer was the person who would did the mathematical equations in math in their heads and write down what a what today's computer is spitting out. Um, yeah, I love that movie. Could connect to... A lot of that, uh, the stories there. It Bunch of badass awesome. women. It was awesome. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. What's not to love about that? <laughs> I don't think I, well, maybe I, I, I have five kids. I live under a rock, clearly. I used to watch Ghost. So the main character in Hidden Numbers was in a, a TV Hidden show. Figures. Hidden Figures. Hidden Figures. Yeah. Hidden Figures. Yeah. Hidden Figures. All right. What was your other one? So you said you had a few. Well, we can well then, um, I have a, a little bad habit at my house is that I iron my clothes and I usually spend and iron my family's clothes. So it's usually a couple hours a week on a weekend, an hour and a half. So I'll pick like a chick flick that I've seen so many times that I don't have to right when you're ironing and you're making the mm -hmm. steam make sounds that I can still watch the movie and follow the movie without hearing every word. So yeah. I would get, go, this one would be a toss up between Sweet Home Alabama Heck yeah. or uh, Legally Blonde. I know it's Reese with a spoon either time, but I'm like, I've, you know, anyways. All right. So that's my, my, my wife loves Sweet Home Alabama. I can I'm a big fan of Sweet Home Alabama myself. I probably yeah. watch it every other month. I probably, I I probably, it. probably plays it every other month yeah. in my house. I mean, I used, did I tape it the first time? I knew. I think I bought the CD and for a while I would have to find a way to put the DVD in somewhere because it was not on streaming anywhere. And, uh, and, and now finally, I don't know which streaming system it's on, but I'm like, okay, now I can find it. So I think the my family kind of leaves the room when I'm popping up, you know, opening the iron board and popping up the Sweet Home Alabama. It's like, okay, time to do something else. <laughs> All right, I can get around that, the guilty pleasure. Just gonna pop it in and just watch something that's doesn't require a lot of thought. I might go with like a Zoolander for that. <laughs> I've watched that one more, <laughs> than, I, more than I want to admit. <laughs> so, all right. Well, very good. Well, hey, Elise, I appreciate you stopping by. And well, not 
and actually, now that we say it, we are going to have an official podcast room in a couple of months. We should do a follow up where you really truly can stop by, oh, yeah. and, and we will make sure when we have the um, the students who come by our offices and stuff, we're going to take up a ton of pictures. We love what the NTC has done for the community. Uh, we love Brian Moyer. We love Elise. We love that you guys are really making sure that the, the technology um, ecosystem here in Nashville is growing and growing and growing as as and starting in the right place, which is like getting kids involved, which is <laughs> phenomenal. Yeah, so it's awesome. We love being a part of it. We thank you for all the work you do. We thank you for coming in. So Elise, thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, and now I have some new restaurants I have to go try. Ah, absolutely. Yeah, right. thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Shane and Taylor. Well, this was awesome. And six months to a year, we're going to do a follow-up and see where the NTC is at. Absolutely. All right. For everyone else, have a great week. Next day.